everybody. Uh, I was going to actually ask you to do a wave if that's okay. Maybe starting on that side. Yeah? All right, hold on. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Yes. Nice. Y'all did so good. That is so great. You're off to a great start here. So thanks again to the good people of Framer for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, even though I'm really nervous. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll start by just a little caveat. Um, this, this talk is full of lots of experiments, and one of the experiments is the talk. So I'm going to thank you in advance for playing along. So first, let's find out a little bit about each other. I, I, I love like at scale people visualization, so we'll get the lights up a little bit. Um, how many of you in here consider yourselves designers? OK, that's a lot of people. How many people formally dis, uh, studied design of the people who are designers? Oh, that's interesting. OK, it's a lot less, just for anybody who um, who's, doesn't have the view that I have. Um, how many of you code? Lots of people. How many people studied coding formally, like engineering or something? A lot less. So that's, that's great. Um, how many of you love and support designers but don't, don't design yourself? Thank you. <laughs> Everybody say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cool, and then um, how many people came here alone without knowing anybody? All right, it's a good number of people, great. Um, hopefully you uh, connect with a bunch of people and make some, make some new friends. I've been thinking a lot lately about connectedness, um, and by connectedness, just to be clear, I'm not talking about wireless connectivity or uh, business networking or anything like that. I'm talking about human connection, you know, the kind uh, that might be requires actual eye contact with another human being, um, you know, or, or a hug. So that, that's the kind of connectedness that, uh, that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And part of the reason that I've been thinking about it is because it turns out, apparently, we're living in a time where there's an epidemic of loneliness around the world. So in the words of the former Sur Surgeon General of the U.S., I'm going to read this out, the world is suffering from an epidemic of loneliness. If we cannot rebuild strong, authentic social connections, we will continue to splinter apart in the workplace, and in society. We live in the most technologically connected age in the history of civilization, yet rates of loneliness have doubled since the 1980s. Today, over 40% of adults in America report feeling lonely, and the research suggests that the real number may be higher. So loneliness is apparently as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, um, and apparently higher to your uh, mortality than, uh, of a risk to mortality than obesity. So. Um, so why do I care about this so personally? Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about my background. I've wor been working for some time, and just over 10 years ago, I was at Apple um, working on this thing um, before it released. You might remember when the story to third-party developers for how they were going to develop for the iPhone were, was web apps. People remember that? <laughs> All right. So <laughs> um, me and Helen Mon, Brian Dote, two of my... Um, teammates over there were working on the first web apps before the iPhone was released. So we were behind, you know, four locked doors. Don't you love this old Chrome? And ch ch check out the shine. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I think at that time, there was no way that we had any idea what was going to happen with this thing. Um, you know, I went on to work on other things, worked on a design system. I thought you might enjoy seeing an de ancient design system here, um, complete with all the little inner shadows and stuff. Uh, for MobileMe and iCloud, and then went on to join HID Prototyping, where I worked with Linda Dong, who you're going to hear from next. Um, in HID Prototyping, we worked on very early UI explorations for new hardware and new human input. Um, eventually, our work wound up touching a whole bunch of different devices, including that thing up on the left, uh, up right is uh, HomePod, in case you're wondering <laughs> what the smiling potato thing is. <laughs> Um, and yeah, we, we wound up uh, doing stuff like Force Touch and the Tapping en Engine and Apple Pencil and uh, other things that have made their way into um, consumers' hands. But during this time, I think I really bought into the early idealism of computation. So let me kind of remind us about that. This quote from 1995 from Steve Jobs. What a computer is to me is it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with, and it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. So, you know, we could have a whole discussion about whether or not we're currently creating bicycles for people's minds that help them with deep thought and understanding, or whether or not we're actually trying to, you know, mostly bolster short behavior that takes a very short amount of time. Um, but that would be a different discussion. I think one of the things that's interesting to me is that since 1995, the computer is no longer a work tool, it's something that's 
throughout our life. It's very ubiquitous. And so the question I've been asking myself is like, at this point in time, computation doesn't only affect our minds, it also affects our hearts and it affects our bodies. So what is it that we want computation to do for us in that respect? I think in the 20 years of stuff that I've worked on, um, the things that have stood out to me the most are those moments of, of connectedness with other people, whether it's through the process of working with them or the things that we create as experiences for other people. And I've been thinking about how we as designers can do more of that. Um, I think one of the things that I always love is making the process of designing itself very playful. Because, you know, we deal with a lot of things, um, but a lot of creativity can happen when, when we're being playful. So, you know, play is not only good for creativity, but it can also improve your relationships and your connections to others. Um, some examples. So when real-time face tracking actually became computationally possible on the HID prototyping team, the first thing we did was goof off. Um, here's some early iterations of that stuff. It, it In happened here, to ship. I can experience some fantastic um, here new is it on stage. face detection effects. Um, now this is everywhere, uh, at least most of most apps um, that allow you to take selfies, I think, uh, try and have some piece of this. But what really stands out to me about that entire experience is actually the journey. <laughs> um, and all of the goofing off that we did together along the way. So this is um, Bas Ording. If you are unfamiliar with him as a person, you are familiar with his work since he's the inventor of inertial scrolling and rubber banding on iOS. Um, and he's Dutch. So when we were working on Force Touch, similarly, when we first got a hold of this gadget, what did we do? Goofed off. So I got some Play-Doh and tried to figure out what that would look like to squish down on. So now imagine that you are pushing down on glass and feeling this thing squish. So we can repeat that and you can pretend in your mind that you're pushing on that screen. Um, and you know, that wound up giving rise to all sorts of more complex things, but we started with play. Um, in another project that I've been involved in, this is called Dynamic Land. It's a long-term research group um, that's based in Oakland in California and they are reinventing a humane computational medium. So this is something where we're really transforming computation so instead of being locked behind tiny rectangles, we feel more like we're cooking with friends when we're actually coding. Um, so back when they were called CDG, before they were called Dynamic Land, there were times when the walls looked like a little bare. You know, there's some interesting stuff going on. Um, but one day I, I visited and I thought, well, why don't I do something a little provocative here and see what happens? So we're playing with the human, the human dynamics of the research group. And so I started cu cut, cutting out little animals um, and plugging them into the prototype. Um, so you can kind of see the work in progress here. Just I decided to make a diorama of little animals. And slowly people just started coming around because I was making this goofy prototype in an open space and people started adding their own stuff. So while this may seem sort of tame, if you think about it in the realm of what is computationally possible, this could lead to sorts of interesting things. Um, eventually, everybody used this sort of creative improvisational technique to a point where we wound up here. <laughs> Um, this is me trying to laser point and film at the same time, so you can see that the, the footage gets a little <laughs> crooked. But yeah, now we're painting with lasers on the wall. and um, So that's one example. This is another example. Um, Paula Tay, who works at Dynamic Land, had make, made something that we refer to as the token table. Essentially, this table lets you move objects on the table as if the objects are moving themselves, which you'll see in a second. But the prototype had been sitting there kind of in a half-baked state for some time, and it wasn't really getting a lot of action from the other researchers. So one Halloween, Paula and I decided we were going to plushy the prototype. So we put little faces on it. We sewed little costumes for pieces of it. And um, that obviously <laughs> led to all kinds of behaviors. In this case, we made the little ghost run away from the monster. Um, again, it seems sort of mild and not necessarily a big deal, but if you think about many applications, and I know you all have wild imaginations of what a table that can move stuff on its surface without you touching it could do, um, it could lead all kinds of places. And this got people to come back to the prototype because it felt sort of safe and playful and, um, and, and provocative. Um, another project in more recent form of Dynamic Land, this is something um, that I created that allows 
especially little kids, to make connections between physical numbers, uh, physical quantity of objects, and symbolic quantity of objects, and creative process. So I'm sure that many of you have changed uh, numbers in some sort of creative file where you're, you know, changing some variable and it changes a picture. And this is allowing me to create an interface that little kids can play with and change the flower, as well as understand the number 12. Um, so here's, here it goes. Whoa, whoa, that's crazy. <laughs> you want to put, you want to put some more here? As many as you want. <laughs> so, so that's a little bit in dynamic land, and you, you could see the other thing that's happening besides us being playful in the creative process is we're creating shared experiences for people. So um, after working at Apple for some time, I wanted to get closer to the deeper meaningfulness of my work. And I found that I was thinking a lot about the education space, just because of how deep it is and how fundamental it is to everything about our society. Um, so I'm now at Khan Academy, where I lead design. Um, yeah. And this is, uh, this, I'm mostly responsible for this team and their shared experiences. So here's, here's our, our, some of our team. Um, they are amazing, wonderful humans, um, and I love them dearly. Uh, you can see we take ourselves very seriously. Um, we do serious things, like we have a design system that we're working on. <laughs> um, but we also have to think a lot about the shared experiences of our customers, of our, of our learners who are students. This is a bad stock photo of what people think a classroom looks like. Classrooms don't look like this um, anymore. Uh, maybe they do very, very rarely, but this does not properly model the different kinds of interactions that happen between humans in a classroom. One thing that happens is students talk to each other. Here are two students talking to each other in Brazil. So it's not like everybody's sitting in isolation like, like the way we are now, all looking at me. They might be talking to each other, um, and that would be deliberate. Another thing that might happen is they might be talking to each other while the teacher's walking around the room. There might be something projective up at the front. People might have their own Chromebooks. Um, or the students might all be with their own Chromebooks, and then there's an additional projected display at the front of the room. You get the idea. There's a lot of context here and a lot of different formations of humans and how they're interacting in human-to-human -human interactions. Um, here's a photo of an actual classroom. You can see the walls are covered floor to ceiling. With more information, you, you get used to many different typefaces happening at the same time um, and lots of different kinds of displays happening. Um, so one of the things that we experimented with is, uh, is now, in our, in our books, it's considered a campaign. Uh, called LearnStorm, so we've done two versions of it, one called Brain Training and one called LearnStorm, and it allows the students to work collectively towards a goal. So Jacob Greif on our team came up with this UI that shows the students collectively how all of their work together is creating progress. So you can see as they do more and more work how the progress ticks up, and it's collective, um, and it gets more and more extra. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let me show you a little bit of, um, of how the students are reacting. This is narrated by a seventh grade teacher. And what was amazing was that the lower achieving students were able to see that they were part of something huge. They were able to contribute and that I thought boosted their self-confidence, their self-esteem and I didn't realize that would happen after doing LearnStorm. I did it. Yep, we we here. Start from the bottom. Now we here. <laughs> yeah, I never thought we'd have people cheering for a UI quite like that. So, um, so the last two things that I want to touch on are culture and physicality. So culture is important because it's it's a bit like dark matter. You can't see it, but it's all around you, affecting everything. It's kind of this social agreement that's unspoken oftentimes. And physicality, which is like our actual bodies because we are organisms. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. We've talked about goofing off and we've talked about shared experiences. So I'm going to help us do that here now, starting within a UI. So again, culture is like the water that's all around us. And I'm going to start with us thinking about our own bodies. So 
we're all familiar with this animation. Yes, this is the like home screen delete thing. And while I was at Apple, I remember people referring to this sometimes as hula. They're like the little icon hula dance. And I, as some of you know, I'm a dancer, and I was like, that's not hula. <laughs> this is also not hula. <laughs> and this is also not hula. Those are Tahitian dance. Hula's from Hawaii. And Tahiti and Hawaii are around 3,000 miles apart, which is nearly the distance between Amsterdam and New York. So don't get it twisted. Um, hula is more like this. This is called awana. This is one form of hula. And hula actually survived about 50 years of being banned, maybe even longer, um, and is an ancient tradition that started out looking more like this. The hands are the wind. The feet mimic the heartbeat. So the thing about this is that this sort of trivialization of a body movement kind of irked me a little, because there's literally hundreds of ways to do this. So moving your hips is actually really technical and also uh, really related to the way that we're built as animals, frankly. Um, so today we're going to talk about that a little bit. And if you haven't thought much about the fact that you're made of a skeleton, so take a second right now, feel the fact that you have a skeleton. Maybe just focus on one bone, like your spine, your elbow. Yeah, cool. Probably been a while since you thought about that, if at all, ever. Um, so one thing to know about yourself is you're held together um, in a structure that's called a tensegrity. So tensegrity is a term that Buckminster Fuller came up with. Um, this is an example of something um, that they made. It may be hard to see in this picture, but those sticks aren't actually touching each other. They're all being held together by a series of tensions. Um, so that's how we're held together. And if you think about your hips, which are the origin of what we were looking at here earlier with the hula dance, your hips are actually really important and barely talked about. They carry over 50% of your body weight, including your vital organs, your brain. Um, and uh, as, as you get older, you're going to need to know more and more about them because that tends to be a health complication area. So in the spirit of uh, Confucius, in that you do and you understand, I'm going to ask you to participate in this experiment. And please stand up if you're able to stand up. Yes, thank you. You're awesome. All right. This is great. I told you I'd switch things up. All right, so this is the anatomy of your hips. Most people, when they think about their hips, so they put their hands on their hips, they're going to feel like a bone kind of up here. So you can just do that and feel that, right? Those are there. And then if you think about where your leg actually meets your hips, it's much lower. So you can sort of feel the fold here. That's kind of down there. There's a thing called the greater trochanter. That's a, a part of your, um, of your thigh bone. And the cool thing is that we have ball joints. So you have four ball joints in your body. You have two in your hips and two at your shoulders. And so for anybody that isn't uh, wanting to explore their hip ball joints, you can also explore your shoulder ball joints. Um, so the cool thing about ball joints is they have three different degrees of freedom. So they can literally move in three directions. Um, in mechanical engineering terms, you can kind of think of all of these joints as what's called a four bar linkage. So four bar linkage in mechanical engineering is four uh, rigid bodies with four joints connected by four joints. And you can kind of think of the floor as the fourth joint. Um, in this case, we're going to explore one called the double rocker. That's one degree of rotation. Um, and this is a technical term, again, from mechanical engineering. Um, so yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. So we can all kind of like lean over one way. And you'll feel the rotation of the ball joint on one side. And then lean over the other way. Yes. And then just keep doing that for a little while. And you'll notice you've probably never thought about it this deeply before. What's amazing, you go over to one side and you can already look fabulous. <laughs> you didn't even need to do anything. I mean, look, she looks amazing. <laughs> if you want to, you know, do that. <laughs> nice. Yes. Love it. Great. Um, and so another little secret is with the same degree of rotation, the other way you can get it is by bending one knee and dropping that hip. So you can just drop just like that. Yeah, and then you can sort of feel that same rotation happen in your hip and do it the other way. So this, I don't know if you've all heard the proverb, if you can walk, you can dance. This is, uh, there's, there are dances that are literally just doing this. You're just bending one knee and then bending the other. 
So I'm going to let you play with that. All right, y'all did great. <laughs> Special shout outs to Jorn and Kuhn, who are also dancing up here in the front, in case y'all can't see them. Yes. Um, so again, looking at this other degree of rotation in your ball joints, there's kind of a twisting that you can do in them. Um, so we're gonna play with that. That's twisting your leg in and out this way. So that's another degree of rotation. And this is Wilson Simonal, who's a Brazilian star, a classic Brazilian star. And if you watch his legs, you'll see them kind of twisted. So uh, let me just play that back and forth a little bit. Yeah, see this action? Great, so now you're going to do that. <laughs> okay, y'all are doing great. <laughs> Congratulate yourselves. I'll, I'll keep congratulating you. You're doing awesome. Um, all right, so this last one is the tuck, under and, and out. So um, it's a little bit, just to borrow from some yoga terms, there's cat and cow. So cat is like scary arch of the back, and then the cow is the other way. Um, so it's a concave and a convex. Um, one of the things that's really important about this movement, actually, is that it, has, it will warm up your psoas. And if you don't know what your psoas is, that's a really important muscle that connects from your spine to your legs. All of you sit a lot, probably, doing office work. Um, and this is a really important muscle um, in order to keep healthy as you get older. Um, so, uh, and then when you flex it, it kind of has this effect. <laughs> so if you think about that, um, you, can, you can point forward and then sideways and then back, right? And then you think about the definition of a circle, which is all of the points that are equidistant from a single point on a plane, um, you can start to do circles using those degrees of rotation. So if you want to just experiment with that a little bit, here's a circle, so you can just kind of like feel that. Bend your knees, because it'll be better. And, and obviously, if you're already a dancer, then you know all this, and you can just have a good time. Um, but if we do a little math, and then pull that back into the prototype. How many of you actually danced your UI before? You can sit now. <laughs> Anybody that's ever done motion design, like, don't lie to me, you've been on the screen and been like, I need it to go like this. Right? Yeah. So now you can dance even more to your UI. Um, cool. So we've gone over a couple things, being aware of culture and its influence on all of us right now. I think we just had a different cultural experience. I imagine you're not used to getting up and dancing in the middle of a talk, so that's new. Um, minding your physicality, so we were just in our bodies. You just had a shared experience, and we were being playful. So all of those are techniques, I think, for us designers to think about as we're creating the world um, or creating a vision of the future. I often get asked what's next technologically, and I think it may be because I've worked on a bunch of technology in the past, for example, at Apple. And I was asked this recently when I give a talk to a bunch of prototypers at Google. And my answer was, let's not talk about what we think the future is going to be. Let's talk about what we want. What do we want to create in the future? And I'll, I'll tell you what I'm thinking about as far as what I want in the future. So there's two things. One and this may be controversial, I think we need to kind of think about what's after screens. I think there's a lot of people that are sort of tired of being locked in this tiny little rectangle. It changes our relationship with our body and with each other. So that's one of my provocations to you. What might we do that really respects the physicality of our interconnectedness and still allows us to play with the dynamic medium without locking us into a little rectangle? The second provocation is what can we do so that we understand human systems at scale. We've already found that a lot of things we create have these ramifications that happen far larger than we ever could have imagined when we launched this technology years ago. 
So how can we start designing deliberately with those larger human system behaviors in mind? And I'm not just talking about optimizing click-through, right? I'm talking about all of the space in between yes and no, like more of the nuance, the kinds of stuff that we've seen go down more recently. I think as designers, we all have these very active imaginations and it's our job to envision what the future could be. So my provocation to you is like, what do you want it to be? And how would you do it in a way where we can wind up being more connected to each other as humans going forward. Thank you.